This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. Well, we're only into five minutes of our conversation, Court, and already we got a man crush going on. <laughs> oh, mine existed before you even invited me on your show. Like, probably about the second or third episode of <clears throat> Bite Sizer when you were doing uh, Dude Looks Like the 80s. I was like, damn, and that, that RJ guy. Oh, I gotta, I gotta get on a podcast with that dude. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host, RJ McCready. And for this episode, I'm going to be taking you guys back to the year in 1985 to look at the cult classic horror movie, Return of the Living Dead. And joining me today for the show is my good friend, Colt Syops from Cinema Syops. Colt, how you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. I am, I am doing excellent. And my first question right off the bat, I am actually very curious, because when we were talking about doing a show together, you actually said, when you think of... Return of the Living Dead, I was like the first podcaster that you thought of. And I'm curious as to what in your mind actually links me to Return of the Living Dead. Okay, so uh, it's about four years ago now I started listening to your show. I got into the Legion podcast and I started listening to Cinema Psyops, which is yourself. And the first show that I listened to was Return of the Living Dead with you and Matt. And I loved it. It was great. I loved what you was doing, the format of your ah. show. <laughs> And, <laughs> right, so this is the thing. So, whilst I was listening to your show, I was actually decorating my bedroom. <laughs> this is where it gets a little bit sexy. <laughs> All right, I'm already All in right. your ear holes yeah. in your bedroom. I'm into so, this. <laughs> so, as I was wallpapering, I could hear the tones of you and Matt talking. It's almost like your voices are now fused into my bedroom wall. <laughs> right? You're not the first person to tell okay. us that. Okay, yeah. And I'll be honest with you, there's a few times I've got into my bedroom and I've gone back to that episode and I can hear you and Matt talking about it. Do you know what I mean? It's just a weird, it's a weird thing. And so, um, I know you covered it, obviously, and I've covered it for uh, Dude Looks Like the 80s, but it's a film that I'd, it's one of those films I'd, I'd love to go back to. It's one of my favourite horror movies and I just thought it'd be great to have you on the show for Bite Size Cinema to talk about this movie. So there you go, that's how that's how it happened, Colt. Like I say, man, you are you and Matt are fused in my bedroom. <laughs> well, you're welcome, slash I'm sorry, uh, I guess. Oh, no, 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 man, it's nothing sorry about it, man. That's great. It's uh So there you go, and like I say, cool, I've been listening to your show ever since and I know you're now up to was it 238 episodes, 240 episodes? Uh, we actually just recorded 254. 254? Oh my god. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I was a little bit behind there, yeah. But no, I like, I like oh, what you're doing, man. It's great. And, um, you know, I love the, um, you know, the combo between you guys, the um, the fun, the, the banter. Uh, Matt is a mysterious guy. Do you know what I mean? He's just... Who, who is Matt Syops? Do you know what I mean? He's, he's like the mystery man on the podcast universe, you know? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, like I, I was saying kind of off mic, he's a lot different than um, what he is on the air. He's a little bit more amped up. And, you know, once you if once you actually meet him, all that mystery kind of just dispels. You know, he seems like he's a lot more mythical and like this, you know, so much larger than life character, mostly because no one's ever seen his face. But once you can actually put a voice to the face, he becomes kind of more demystified and it's fine. Well, that's, uh, that sounds like superhero status to me, you know, like Clark Kent. <laughs> no one would know Clark Kent was a superhero, would they? Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like he's got this alter ego. <laughs> well, and I, I feel like I might have been a lot of the same way until I started posting photos of myself and you'd see me snuggling with my cats and everything. And that kind of demystified who I was because um, like we talked about it before. I've had listeners like drawing pictures of what they thought I looked like from how I described myself in the earliest days of the show before I actually, you know, showed up and, and started posting photos of myself. And while I don't share my actual last name, you know, I mean, pretty much everything about the character that I play in podcasts is who I am for the most part. I just amplify it up just a little bit. Um, and like I said, Matt has to kind of somewhat play himself down because as 
his voice is so boisterous and everything and so he's got to pull that back a little bit if you're in a if you're in a crowd you'll be able to pick him out anywhere yeah, like a crowded see. loud bar with music thumping and you you can hear him so <laughs> like I, in the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> so have i ever met um matt for real i'll just have to blindfold myself and go yep i know you are now because i can hear your voice and <laughs> you may uh, need earplugs too if you're in the room with them no it sounds like a whole ton of fun man and like i say you know you guys just the way you bounce off each other with your show it's great do you know what i mean it's just it's entertainment that you just can't write do you know what i mean that is just that's just a natural thing that you've got going there so i love it man it's great you know you got up to 250 episodes so that's testament for your show do you know what i mean so it's it's good stuff man and um your, your latest episodes i saw you uh, I did listen to your latest one. It was something to do with a couple of ladies, was it? And sort of like a sort of a bit of a B movie action movie or something like that, was it? <laughs> oh yeah, we're doing we're doing the Andy Sedaris films, the Lethal Ladies series. Uh, yeah. I like to close out every year with like a longer franchise um, that basically takes us from a run from some type of special episode. In this case, it was 250, and we're going all the way up to the end of the year, which, if I did my calculations right, should be somewhere around like 260 something but we're stopping year five and starting year six now when i say stop and start we don't actually take any breaks we go every week there's a new episode of new content of some sort um every week there's no evergreen stuff there's no reusing things that i've recorded on other people's shows um the only time i do that is if i release it as like bonus content it's always a new episode every week that we've been doing this and we've done it for over five years now and we're coming up on our sixth year at this point. Wow. And <laughs> so, and the only way that really differentiates it is I switch out the music. I'll, I'll make a different uh, theme song for every year. And then I kind of twinkle with the format a little bit and change it just a little bit every year. Um, we've basically, every time we keep changing things up, it's because I got bored with doing it the old way and I want to do something different. And I think that's kind of my OCD kicking in where I'm like, what if we just change this? What if we just change that? And Hopefully that keeps the listeners interested too. Yeah, I, I get that. It's good to change things around a little bit, isn't it? Just to sort of, um, like I say, do something different than that. But, um, but yeah, no, like I say, some of the films that um, you've reviewed, you know, I was just thinking, where have all these films come from? You know, I, I said this with uh, The Witch from the Doomsday Clock when he guested on my show. We, we reckon in Area 51 there's not UFOs or anything mysterious. It's just a big VHS tape recorder, which is just turning out all these films you know <laughs> it's just maybe there's a time machine there and they're just going back and they just keep on releasing these films which i've you know what i mean i'm just going how the hell have i never heard of these films you know because you know i was quite an enthusiastic guy in the film world you know with the vhs stores and all that and i'm just thinking i haven't even heard of this film <laughs> well and i talked about it on my show yeah. one of the things that i love to do is just um when i was a kid i would go into these vhs rental stores mm. And I would go to a section like I would just start in the horror section of every store until I exhausted that. And I would rent A to Z. I would just basically rent them. Right. Um, most of them most of them had like five movies, five days, five bucks. You know, I'm sure they probably had that over there. Only it was probably like five pounds or maybe a little less. But um, every movie store came up with that deal where it was like five, 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 seven, 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 two, two, two. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it was basically a buck a movie for, you know, their older releases or whatever. And I would just go in the horror section and I would rent like the first five movies in the A section. And then I would move my way up till I got to B then C then D. And I would go all the way until wow. I had the complete horror section rented. Most of the time I was dubbing them as I was doing this. I can admit that now because it's not quite as illegal to have VHS tapes of dubs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I used to infringe copyright. Um, and one of the one of the movies that I actually ended up seeing for the very first time was Return of the Living Dead that way. No, you're kidding um, me. When I, when wow. I got up to the R's, and I, I, I dubbed this. My, my very first copy of Return of the Living Dead, I dubbed from a VHS rental store. Wow. Oh, man. Just to go back to those times and rewatch this movie from refresh from a VHS rental, you know what I mean? You can just stop. I've said this before. I think I say this in pretty much all my episodes. That, that smell of the plastic cover of the VHS um, rental box, you know, it's almost like fused with... Because the guy... Th um, the VHS store I used to go into, the guy behind the counter, he was a chain smoker. Do you know what I mean? And you yep, used to go in yep. there and the whole place would be fused with plastic and smoke. 
And for me, it was just a magical place, you know, because as soon as I walked in there and I saw these videos on the shelf, I was like going back, you know, I was going into these worlds, you know, of horror, or action and adventure and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I, th I think we were lucky back then in a funny sort of way. I mean, you, you, you're able to get hold of stuff easy today, but back then it just seemed a little bit more magical, if you know what I mean, which I, which, which I know you sort of get what I'm saying. You know? Yeah, they they tried harder with the cover art. They oh. tried harder <laughs> to get your attention yeah. um, with the way that they designed things. And they really, it was like going to a comic book shop because yeah. there's so much competition that every cover has to be as salacious and insane as possible to infect your you know young adolescent mind and be like i gotta read that or i gotta watch that um i have a question about like vhs stuff uh for for like basically your experience in your rental shops did you guys get those like shaker boxes that were like clear and you could stash the actual videotape inside with the case or, or the the cardboard uh, cover and then all you had to do was squeeze it and then the tape would shake out the bottom did you guys get a lot of those or did you have more of the pop open cases the pop open cases we had, we didn't have those shaker boxes, but um, Ricky Morgan posted that on his, um, you know what awesome show, I think he put that on there. You know what Rick's like, yeah. hey, hey, you remember these? <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. Well. Um, but no, we didn't get those in the UK, but I'm familiar with that. But no, Okay, so the shaker boxes were more of a um, mid to late 90s is when they really started kicking out. Um, and those were not as much fun. Because the fun was always the VHS, like the, the actual like VHS uh, cardboard box, usually with like some foam or something stuffed in there to make it like a little more solid and then wrapped in like saran wrap or something to protect it, sitting out front. And then you were always like dreading that if you reached and grabbed that and like were looking for the actual movie, they either didn't have that behind the counter or in some cases video stores just started putting the tapes in the cases behind the actual cardboard VHS. Right. And that was like the real fun is the hunt of like, do they actually have this one in stock? Well, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. Yeah, because that was the other thing, wasn't it? Going down there thinking, have they got this film in stock? And if they did, it was a great thing. If they didn't, you come out and you go, oh, Dan, you know. Um, but that was the other thing, actually. Um, in the 90s, as a teenager, I'd spent a lot of time treasure you know as you know i do all my treasure hunting and stuff i was kind of treasure hunting in a different sort of way i was looking for vhs tape tapes because um you had your run of the mill films readily available like jaws star wars but all the films i watched as a kid like um Krull and biggles in time and all those sort of films maybe even return of the living dead that might have been guilty of that you just couldn't find them in the 90s they just weren't you know you go down to the local uh, we had a store called Woolworths, it had, you know, it's like a sort of Walmart or something like that. But you just couldn't find them. So I, I went to all the charity shops and it was like an adventure. So it was another, it was an adventure from the 80s going into the 90s for me. And in all honesty, it was a whole ton of fun because when I actually found those movies, it was like, wow, I felt like Indiana Jones finding some sort of, <laughs> like the, the Ark of the Covenant. Hey, I found Biggles in time on VHS, you know. So yeah, it was an, it was an adventure. Good times, man. Good times. I think that's why we're here today, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, growing up um, in the mountains of Pennsylvania, where I actually grew up, and when I say in the mountains, I mean like wow. if you took the wrong turn, you ended up in a horror movie. If you took the correct turn, oh you ended God. up in my hometown, like wow. that far out in the mountains. <laughs> that's where I grew up. <laughs> Oh I don't God. sound like it because I worked really hard to actually speak like a normal human being and not talk <laughs> like a mountain folk. So um, your, your next door neighbor was Freefinger, was it, from Wrong Turn? <laughs> uh, not too far off, like deep enough into the mountains, there would be like hillbillies that were forced to actually let their kids go to school and their mother might also be their sister. Like that, oh. that, was, that did happen in parts of where I grew up. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that it wasn't my family, mind you, it, but it, it did exist there. Like if you got far enough up into the mountains, that was a thing that did happen. Uh, but there was a like little market that, um, I grew up next to a state park too. Yeah. So there was like a little market that was like basically like a price gouging, um, market for like the tourists and stuff like that, because it was just right outside of the state park. 
And I lived close enough to where I could walk down to that. And that market also started renting videotapes. Oh, and okay. that's that's kind of how like and they couldn't get or they couldn't afford the good stuff like, you know, because Jaws would be more expensive to license from a distributor to be able to rent or, or you know, some of those other bigger movies. So they were always getting like these like crappy packages like from Full Moon or Troma and stuff like that. And one of the VHS tapes that they had was The Return of the Living Dead. And I remember that cover um, even being like a really, really little kid, like like super young, not allowed to watch horror movies in the store. I would walk past that cover and I would see those zombies and it would just get ingrained in my head. And the movie that was going on in my head and what I was picturing from seeing those mm. punker rotten green skeletons was so much more scary than the actual movie when i got to see you know it was just so crazy and insane and just my imagination ran wild with that cover and that's one of the glories of seeing those covers like that because it really does infect your brain it was like that one and day of the dead right next to each other and like i was terrified of zombies without ever actually having seen a zombie movie because just over the hill from my house was like a world like a, a Civil War era cemetery. It goes back to like the Civil War era and before of, uh, of the cemetery. It was just over the other side of the hill and like another, like a highway away from my house. So, and just like an old two lane blacktop too, nothing really that big. Yeah. So every time I would see something having to do with zombies or I would like picture zombies coming up out of the grave, the first thing I thought was, well, we're doomed. We're right next to a cemetery. We're, we're doomed. You know, it's neither the living dead yeah. time. That's and it. while I saw Night of the Living Dead first, and that really, you know, pushed that that fear, I didn't know Night of the Living Dead wasn't real. And so every time I kept seeing zombie movie boxes everywhere, I was like convinced that this was something that happened and could happen again. And I was just terrified of them this whole time. And like you say, this all boils back to that cover art, doesn't it? You know, that's that is what that, oh, is, yeah. the, that is the power of that. And you know what amazes me is. Um, since I've been listening to podcasts, obviously this is a global thing, isn't it? So I'm, you know, talking to you guys over in the States or the witch down under. And this whole community that we've got is that everybody says the same thing, don't they? Do you know what I mean? With the, you know, the looking at that cover of the VHS, you know, even Rick surprised me the other day when he was talking about Jaws on his show. And, it, and I said this on my last episode to Dan Bone, you know, Rick came out and said something. I thought, oh my God, I thought it was just me. When he said he watched Jaws as a kid, and he couldn't even walk across the fucking floor because the floor was blue, and he thought it was the water. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's like, "Wow, the power of that film that has infused that trauma." Do you know what I mean? It's and that's also a test, yeah, like you know, kids that can't jump into a pool or are afraid of sitting on a toilet because there's water in the toilet. Yeah. And what if the shark swims up that way? Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that story. Yeah, there's I'm been a- plenty of kids that are like that. I think even Matt has a story similar to that where he not even so much the ocean but like a lake nearby he was mm. afraid to go into mm. and you know for me it was like piranha and the 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 lake that is in the state park that i grew up near you know i was afraid that like what if somebody's experimenting you know because it was a man-made lake yeah so that it had a it had a reservoir area to the to the man-made lake too and i'm like you know and there's like a fish hatchery there too so i'm like what if they're making piranha there just like in that movie <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just you know. get out into the lake yeah this is it you know so for me growing up in the 70s and the 80s you know i felt like i was totally screwed because you know i was watching all the charlton heston movies so you had earthquake you had airport 77 you had jaws uh, you had alligator um, you had alien invasions you, you, as, a, as a kid growing up I thought there's nothing you can do you've got danger coming from everywhere do you know what I mean zombies coming out from the cemetery all that sort of stuff you think what the hell <laughs> yeah I think no our wonder. generation specifically is more prepared for this kind of crazy mm. world that we're oh, currently yeah. living mm. in than any oh, other yeah. generation we're all like yeah well this is just like all the movies that we used to watch we're, we're prepared for this like george romero has me prepared for everything that's coming uh, you know like it may suck and i may uh, be terrified but at the same time i'm ready there is there's got to be a certain amount of training that you get from these films isn't there do you know what i mean what, what will you do in the zombie well i've seen dawn of the dead a few times so i figured we'd do this so you're getting trained sort of tactically aren't you through movies it's it's got it's got a rub on off on you in some way <laughs> <laughs> yeah it kind of turns you into a little bit of a prepper but like not an asshole prepper that steals all the toilet paper but like somebody that knows that you need to get all the dry goods <laughs> and you know that blades don't need reloading so you know trust in the machete like tom savini and dawn of the dead 
<laughs> yeah, I think someone posted that on Facebook actually you know, a few months ago saying, was it going like 50 years ahead from now and there's a little kid saying, hey, Grandpa, what did you do in the apocalypse, you know, or COVID-20 or 19? And the grandpa goes, well, I stole all the toilet roll. And this little kid goes, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I bought all the bog roll. That's what I did. So no yeah. one else could have any. Oh, you're such a hero, granddad. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I thought that just about summed it all up. But um, yeah, yeah, no, it's all good stuff, cool. But um, shall we have a look at this movie then, mate? Shall I do, um, we get into a trailer. Um Go back to 1985, go back to the cemetery, and we'll play you guys a trailer, and we will see you soon. In the dark of the night, something strange is going on. And now the question is, how do we get them back into the ground? Bert, Frank, we have a little problem. Ah, Four left, ten right. Ah, ah, Puzzle, because technically you're not alive. Why do you eat people? Not people, brains. How do you kill something that's already dead? Well, how do I know, Fred? I don't know. Let me think. It's not a bad question, Bert. In that movie, they destroyed the brain to kill him. Is that what they did? The brains, right? Brains. is nervous. Usual crap. The police are confused. Send more cops. It worked in the movie. What ain't working now? In the movie line. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. Not a bad question, Bert. The return. Of the living dead. And welcome back, guys. So the synopsis of this film is when two bumbling employees at a medical supply warehouse accidentally release a deadly gas into the air. The vapours cause the dead to rise again as zombies. It's a comedy. Oh yeah, boy, is it comedy. It definitely is a comedy. It's a horror. It's a sci-fi. I'm not sure where they get the sci-fi element from. Um, uh, the chemical that raises the dead, perhaps, makes it science fiction, I guess. Uh, right, okay, yeah, okay. I was just uh, Every time I think of sci-fi, I think of something out of space or something like that. But yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that's a good shout on that. The, was it the 245 Triarch scene, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's either 245 or 254, but all yeah. I know is the trioxin part. Um, so <laughs> trioxin is the important part, and that's a thread that goes through all of these movies is that specific chemical. Yeah. And it never it never weakens or dilutes. Like once a body is infected with it, it must replicate itself inside that body because like a single body can infect multiple others, like, you know, regardless, it, it, even if you keep it in a giant canister. It was made by the Army Corps of Engineers. 
that leaks the minute you tap the side of it just gently. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, the army engineers, you know, they're, they're pretty good on that, didn't they, containing this? <laughs> um, so, you you just said, Court, you said you watched this film. It's one of the first movies that you rented from the uh, VHS store back in the day. So, what sort of impact did this film have on you back in the day? Oh, man. The VHS tape that I dubbed of like this and a couple of other movies, this was a movie that terrified me when I watched it. And I'm dubbing stuff at like six, seven, eight, and nine because I wanted to be able to watch it again. And like basically, I had friends that wouldn't believe me that these movies existed. This is like the earliest days of podcasting, right? You watch something, yep. then you tell someone else about like this crazy movie where this body is in a freaking can <laughs> and it's made by the army corps of engineers and a couple of guys just start screwing around with it it busts open and then leaks everywhere and raises the dead and then you say all this other stuff that happens where like these punk rockers are getting their brains eaten and stuff and people are like no that that's not real that's not a real movie you're like you're playing on the playground with your other the other kids are like seven eight nine and you're like no seriously this happened and they think you're lying yeah so then i started figuring out how to record tapes and dub tapes so that I would tell my friends about it. I'm like, no, man, I've got this. I copied that movie, you know, and then you'd sneak it over to their house and then you'd be like hanging out with them and hope the parents don't notice that you're playing the movie. And then you start showing other people the movie, <laughs> you know, and they're like, holy crap, this is real. I'm like, I told you. Yeah, I know. And it's a, it's a memorable experience as well, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? You capture that. And, um, you know, for me, this film, I just... Uh, if someone said to me, I've, oh, Jay, I've never seen an 80s horror movie. Can you just recommend one for me? I'd probably say go and watch Return of the Living Dead because, um, you know, there's a whole ton of good horror movies out there. But this one for me just seems to be very unique in terms of characters, storytelling, special effects, soundtrack, the general pace of the movie. Um, I it's know, a snapshot of that time. It's like a perfect snapshot of 1985. Yeah. E- even to the point of how they, you know, recruited actors for this movie. You know, the, I think the Spider character who was homeless at the time. Um, I think you had uh, Trash, or who was the? Linnea Quigley is Trash's character. She's the one that strips naked and dances, and that's what. Linnea Quigley was known for in these types of films, like any kind of exploitation or horror. At some point in time, if you see her, you know she's going to be taking off her clothes. Yeah, you know, and do you know what I mean? It just what sort of movie does that today? Do you know what I mean? It's just, it just seems like it was like you know, filmmaking where they just seem to be able to do what they want. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like you know, you can imagine back in that time, probably 1984. I was, let's go and get a stripper from the nightclub and get her on set, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's, and I think that's why this film works, is because it's just, it, it seems like they had a whole ton of fun making this movie, you know, I've seen the extra, you know, the the extras on the on the Blu-ray and all that, and um, the actual building block to this film is just fantastic, do you know what I mean? It's just, I, I can't compare it to any other movie, I don't know if you can. Um, I think probably the closest in tone and feelings is probably the first and second fright night oh. relief has the same kind of feeling because it when it gets dark yeah. and when the horror hits it's really dark and horrific in these in, in all three of those films but then it still has this very light very silly tone mm. where it's almost like looney tunes where they're running away from the zombies and somebody falls and then there's this weird sound effect you know while the zombies are screaming brains so like when the zombies are attacking they're absolutely terrifying. Yeah. But when the people are running away and falling all over themselves, it's absolutely hilarious. You know, and it's kind of the same with Jerry Dandridge is absolutely horrifying. But at the same time, he's like this cornball that likes to crack jokes at you and, and play on your fears. And it also becomes funny the way this stuff happens, too. So I, I think those three films are probably really akin. Mm. You could probably watch them all together and really enjoy them. Yeah, they just seem to capture something, don't they? I can't really explain it. Do you know what I mean? It's like you, that's a good that's that's a good analogy actually bringing up Fright Night because I see Fright Night as a film like you just said I don't, what is it they did do you know what I mean because I watch it and I just think there's something almost comic book about it that they've got it's with the the smoke and the atmosphere and like say the the nighttime scenes it just do you know what I mean it's, it's hard to try and 
explain, do you know what I mean? It's I think we all, like you say, we all experience it when we watch these films, but it just seems to have captured something. It's almost like a if sort you do, of conjuring or if, something. Yeah, if you do horror and comedy just right, mm. you have to do it just right to mix them together. But the thing about horror and the thing about comedy is there's this buildup of tension and then there's a release. Now, it's either a laugh because they're setting up some kind of a joke and it's sort of making you a little uncomfortable because they're talking about something that you really don't want to think about. And then they hit the punchline and that makes it okay. And then you laugh. Whereas with horror, it's building up, it's building up. You have that scare core that's just getting ready to go, but the, the music is just rising. And then all of a sudden, like Jason or whoever pops out yeah. and you have that jump scare. And then you're like, ah, so you're either ha 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 or ah, the, the horror movie comedy combo. It's that perfect thing of you're going to laugh and scream almost at the same time. So they'll do a jump scare it is absolutely shocking, but then they'll have something to it that it's it's ridiculous and funny. So, you know, you'll see like, for instance, Suicide's Death is like a perfect example of that, right? Because the tar man is absolutely horrifying. Yeah. And when he's slurching at you and everything, he just looks disgusting and you know he's got to smell awful. And when he finally gets up to suicide, basically suicide falls and starts twitching and then he bites his head open. And there's no way that rotten teeth in a body can snap open a skull and rip off like yeah. flesh all like that all at once. And so when that happens, it's absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely horrifying. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And you just have to laugh and scream at the same time. And I think that tone is perfect. And you said that this felt like a comic book to you. And, and that is actually a perfect example. Mm. They actually hired a production designer. William Stout was a, a comic book artist and actually a very famous like illustrator for like um conan the barbarian stuff and everything he had actually done a lot of like i think conan comics and things like that and i think he did some of the production work on the conan the barbarian movie for for uh, milos as well right but what he, what he did for this and what they like him and dan o'bannon had actually decided they were going to do is the aesthetic for this film was going to be very much based on ec comics so all of the corpses that when they're rising from the dead the, like the real hero ones with a lot of the makeup or the puppetry versions of them, they very much look like and try to capture the way that corpses look when uh, Bernie Wrightson uh, for EC Comics would draw them. And if you look at some of the covers of the old school EC Comics uh, with like corpses coming out of the grave or the way that the monsters look, and then you compare them to the zombies and the monster looking creatures in this film, it's almost like one on one perfect. And that's all down to William Stout and his production design. Uh, anybody who has the special features to see it, I mean, even like the original DVD back in the day had this. So like, you know, all the all the ones that have come up, even like whatever Arrow or uh, Scream Factory releases that you may have, go find the stills of the production design that William Stout did. They are incredible, including Tar Man. Uh, the way that he drew him, he looked like he was made out of bones and sewage. Mm. And it's so gross. And he's probably the closest they got to what William Stout had actually drawn, where it's comical yet disgusting and horrifying all at once. And I think that's what captures that feeling so well in this film, is that production design and them adhering to that look. Even the Resurrection Cemetery, the mm. Resurrection Funeral Home, the, the way that the the statues and everything that they built for them, like the weeping angels and everything, they are very comic book design and they basically emulated that so perfectly. And even the punks are over the top. You could see any of the punks that are like, like are in this film and how their design is and how they're, how they look and how they dress. They look exactly like how punks got drawn in the eighties. You would have seen that in like a Grant Morrison doom patrol you know where they would run into this kind of those kinds of characters or like you know they they're taking on batman <laughs> you know or or they end up in the swamp with like alan moore's swamp thing you know like those kind of like really over the top like piercings with like a chain going through your nose that goes to your ear and then gets threaded through your cheek and that kind of stuff that's all very 80s comic books where they're going more and more extreme to the point of like almost over the top ridiculousness and it just it's just a perfect snapshot of that time frame. Then you throw in all that punk rock over top of it, man, and it's just it's like perfect. It's exactly what it needed to be. And that's the other thing, cool, isn't it? Like you say, you've got all that comic book and then you've got the soundtrack to this film as well, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? I mean it you know, if you just brought out that soundtrack without this movie, it'd be great, wouldn't it? But you put the two together, you just got like a well, 
forgive the pun, but it's like a nuclear bomb going off, isn't it? Which ultimately happens at the end. But it's <laughs> like that, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? You just, I mean, I listen. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've listened to the soundtrack to this movie, especially in my car. You know, I just, I just almost get into my car. Feet. I just can't play this again, can I? And I'll put it on. I just ne- never get fed up with it. You know, it's just, you know, the SSQ tonight, the cramps. You know, it's just. And all those Surf and Dead is my favorite cramp song of all time. Yeah. I've never been able to find a cramp song that I love more than that. And yeah. it's only on the soundtrack. They made that specifically, recorded it for this soundtrack. It it I think it's I think it's released as like a bonus track on the Smell of Female live album, but that's it. It's um it goes to one of my favorite parts of the movie when you've got scars. And you've got, is it Bert and Spider? And they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're having a go at the zombies, aren't they? And, you know, they're trying to haul up and, you know, plug up the windows and Scuzz gets an axe and all that. And you just think, this fit, it, that song goes so well to that moment. Do you know what I mean? It just complements it so well. Um, it's just, it shows it's just the ridiculousness amazing. and the hopelessness of their situation, too, because it's this really <laughs> upbeat, sort of happy surf rock yeah. song. And they're talking about dead people coming back to life just to surf. And. <laughs> The whole time they're fighting for their lives in this horrible situation and it's just enough sugar to make the medicine go down you know like because yeah. you're just horrified but at the same time there's like this fun swinging song over top of it where you know you're just like man that otherwise that would just be too much it's yeah. really scary that's it well this is it yeah you know the surfing dead you know just that yeah just just it complements it so well and it really it's some really good development for the characters as well do you know what I mean with you know Bert um, teaming up with the punks and you, you, you're rooting for them as well aren't you do you know what I mean you do and it's the other thing with this film you do not want any of these characters to die um, because when Bert I'm kind of okay with because they they heavily imply that Bert's a Nazi so I'm kind of okay with the bad stuff that happens to oh, Bert oh man yeah this is the other <laughs> thing as well isn't it do you know what I mean that's the clever thing isn't it it's like the thing that they're they're telling you but they're not telling you aren't they do you know what I mean it's just you've got all the things that are there in that mortuary haven't you He's got a bloody. Oh no! I'm sorry. It's Ernie. Ernie is the Ernie is, is the uh, the guy that runs the mortuary. Bert is the the guy that runs the medical supply, and they heavily imply that Ernie is like oh, a retired. Oh yeah, Nazi. that's right. Yeah, Bert is it for God's sake, Frank? Man, the hell up, isn't it? <laughs> it's like. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that's awesome about this movie too, mm. if you notice in the background, there's actually a thing where. Um, they have uh, stuff in the background that you can look at that there's visual gags. Like the, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the mm. eye chart yep. in Bert's office actually says Bert is a slave driver down it. Yeah. That's and then it, yeah. a bunch of other things that it gets smaller and too hard to read. That's it. And then you've got, uh, you need a medical supply warehouse, isn't it? You need a. Yeah, it's very clever. You need a. <laughs> <laughs> I have that as a patch on my uh, horror themed battle vest. It's uh, one of the breast pocket flaps. I. I I stitched that right over top of the flap, so it's like right there. Yeah, the exact like what that billboard looks like. It's that exact thing, um, just in patch form. Um, One of the other jokes too. It's Bert and Ernie, like a reference to Sesame Street characters. You know? Yeah, this is it. (laughs) Just weird little offbeat mm. humor (laughs) mixed in with it. I mean, it's like it's like what you and Matt said when you did your show. You know, like Resurrection Sesame Street. You know, you know, I like that when you chuck that in. But apparently, um, Dan O'Bannon, the director, he's he's pretty much down to say that he didn't do that on purpose. It was just a, you know, it was just a sort of when they said to him, "Do you know this is the characters from Sesame Street?" He went, "Are they?" I didn't know that, so it wasn't done on purpose. But it just works fine, doesn't it? And I, I'm I'm fused with that now. Every time I see them too, I just think of Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street. It's great. <laughs> Well, and they have uh, a very yeah. similar friendship too, where they're going back oh, and yeah. forth like that. So oh, yeah. you, you kind of wonder. I mean, maybe it wasn't intentional, but if that name was in the script, you know. And I know a Bannon kind of wrote on the script as well. And we should kind of talk about this. The the origins of this film go back to Night of the Living Dead, um, mm. when Romero and and John Russo were teamed up. Yep. And they did Night of the Living Dead. One of the agreements that they had was Living Dead, the end of Living Dead, whatever of the Living Dead. You know, when it started with Night, mm-hmm. that was going to be what John Russo owned. And then what um, what George Romero was able to do was just of the dead from uh, there. Yeah. So that's why Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead. And that's how they split. So they could still mark it on and start with the starting point of Night of the Living Dead. This is supposed to be Russo's sequel 
to Night of the Living Dead. And they even make reference to Night of the Living Dead whenever they're talking about the bodies in the basement. And they're like, oh, no, that wasn't really what happened. What really happened was there was chemicals that leaked in a morgue and all of a sudden all of these, like, you know, in an army hospital, all of these, uh, the dead start getting up and then they they had to throw the bodies in barrels and that's where it all started from. So they reference that and they're constantly like, well, didn't it work in that movie? You know, when they're trying to kill the brain. Mm -hmm. And no, they made the guy change the details in Night of the Living Dead or they'd sue his ass. So So they're referencing... A movie that and they say no this is what really happened <laughs> yeah. and that's what makes it feel real and scares you even mm. more when you're a kid watching this you're like holy crap so this is what really happened for night of the living dead yeah that's it that's where you got Bert, isn't it he goes well didn't they what did they do in that movie they uh did a headshot or something like that i think that's what we need to do isn't it you know and they got that cadaver haven't they in the in that sort of holding room isn't oh. it you know just <laughs> and you got frightened when they're you. cutting the head off of that poor guy yeah. and he's just screaming in pain that's pretty horrible but it's not as bad as the split dog whenever frank is just like beating on the split dog with a crutch and it's just yelping and and just like screaming in pain and i'm like the thing's already cut in half and still moving around and can yeah, feel it. stop or yeah. just stop that's great isn't it because that's that's when they've come up isn't it from that canister isn't it it's after the, the credits and yeah. Frank, Frank's going, oh, oh, oh my God, like this. And he's going, and then he, he sort of, he takes a moment, doesn't he? And then all of a sudden you hear this dog going, oh, 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 oh. Like this is a bloody dog on the floor, split door, panting, isn't it, moving. And he's like, oh my God, what the hell is going like this? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so dude. horrifying yeah. and funny all at once. And you've got the butterflies as well, haven't you? And they come to life as well. Um, apparently yeah. that was a cheap special effect, wasn't it? They just waved a bit of air on there just to make it look like they're, they're flapping. They're not something. even real butterflies. No, it's very clever. They, they, they cut out like magazine photos of butterflies or something like that from mm-hmm. like a like a, a magazine for enthusiasts of butterflies. They like the bigger pictures of them and stuff like that, that they could actually get the right size. Yeah. They just pinned them to the cardboard like that. And then they just flapped the air with like a piece of cardboard and then they got it to, to flap. Uh, the split dog was a pretty simple puppet as well. Uh, where, it, you know, they, they basically built a fake split dog and then it was just a little something to make its legs kick and then a couple of wires and it all went up through the stem that it was sitting on that they were able to kind of animate that dog and everything. I mean, this is the other thing. I mean, talking about these effects, and I mean, this is a lot of film for a $4 million budget as well. This is, this is a cheap budget movie, isn't it, for that time? It's a hell of a lot of movie for your buck, I think. And I think it goes all the way back to the planning and that production design of just knowing what it is that they needed and knowing how to make it work and make it look like they did. Um, For a medical supply warehouse, the place is really not that big. I noticed that this this time watching it where I'm like, they don't really have a lot of stuff, but Mm -hmm. they got plenty of room for skeletons with perfect teeth that they get from India. That's right. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, that's right, Freddy. These ones, you know. Like he, he's so enthusiastic, isn't he? I mean, Freight Cran. When you talk about him, he's he is um, he's got a lot of charm. He's got a lot of conviction, isn't he? Hey, Freddie, let's have it. Let's show you around. You're doing a good job, Freddie. That's it. Put the styrofoam in the box. That's it. You you're on the way. <laughs> and now, uh, and at know. one point, the guy's like being silly about it. He's like, "Now take this serious, kid. You know, the, the ex- he's throwing the Excelsior on, and he's making a wisecrack about it. And he's oh, like, yeah, I'll that's take right. this serious, kid.'" That's right. It's, it's about the split dogs, isn't he? Because he goes, "These are split dogs," and then he, then Freddie goes, rrr, rrr. He goes, "Don't don't muck <laughs> around, Freddie. Take this seriously. It's your first day on the job." <laughs> and that's what makes and this. What's really charming. bizarre too? Uh, they're joking about the skeletons with perfect teeth, mm. and he thinks that it might be a uh, like a, a farm in India or whatever. And Dan O'Bannon claims that after they made that joke, mm. the skeletons for this international treaty that come from India, which was like an actual thing, mm. for some reason that dried up, and so he's like, maybe they actually did grow people. Oh my <laughs> specifically god! Specifically for skeletons. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is it. I mean, this is the crazy thing with this film, isn't it? It's almost like sort of like hidden references, isn't there? Isn't it? Um, oh man so um, yeah so you've got these characters and um, going back to the, like the general what you said earlier with these characters I just think what's good, the other thing that's good about this film is everybody is on the same line if you know what I mean like I, I love all the characters in this film you know apart from the 
possibly the colonel dude is a bit of a you know arsehole but um you know all the mate you know oh, oh, i've already had pork chops for lunch you know and all this crap <laughs> but what's really funny about the colonel's house um this is one of the things that o'bannon talks about in the commentary that was not a stage they didn't build all of that they filmed in someone's actual mansion so he's oh, like if you have a problem with that decor and the way that it looks that was someone's actual taste oh, like wow. the way that that whole house is set up <laughs> the only thing they added was that like sort of bs uh, military command center thing that was in that cabinet oh, you know they, right. they kind of oh, built yeah. that but i guess the cabinet existed and they just retrofitted in there yeah yeah just all the characters in this uh, they seem to work and it's the same as what you said with uh, fright night um I think you could say that, you know, a lot of people like the Jerry Dandridge character as well. Do you know what I mean? He's he's the nemesis, but everybody seems to love him. Do you know what I mean? He's got, um, I think I saw someone say on a bit of a Friday Night Tangent that he is a bit of a kind of forgiving vampire, if you know what I mean? Little references he makes on those in that movie. but um, And it's the same with this film as well, isn't it? With the Tarman character, as you said, you know, there's a, there's a big, I think there's a big sort of cult fan base for the tar man character isn't it um looking on oh, social yeah. media I'm, I'm rooting for tar man like mm. i don't want him to kill most of the characters mm. but like i'm rooting for tar man when he pops up because like he looks like he's in pain and the way that he walks you know it was i guess it was a mime or something like that that plays him because he has so much control over his body and it looks like his bones are just sort of like not being held together by the ligaments anymore so he's just kind of slipping and the, you can actually see where like his hips don't fire right and aren't holding them up and where the bone slips off the hip a little bit like it's grody and you know he's in pain and he's just really horrifying but at the same time you're like i just i just want you to be okay bud like him and the in when they're fighting off the zombies and when scuzz bites it literally whenever he gets bitten by the zombie with white hair that then turns pink because of the blood spraying off of oh yeah scuzz's that's right. head. Yeah, yeah and they have her strapped to the table and then she just basically says you know, they have to eat brains because it makes the pain of being dead go away. They can feel themselves rotting when they're resurrected mm. from this trioxin, which is absolutely horrifying to think about. Like, they're in so much pain, they can feel the decay mm. and the rotting that is happening. And the only thing that makes it go away is eating our brains. We're almost being selfish, not allowing them to eat our brains. Yeah, that's it. And I think that's what can create some trauma for you as, as an audience watching this film. It's another thing that goes into your mind thinking, oh, God, what if you die? You can still feel the pain, which is kind of what they're insinuating in this movie, isn't it? When they come back, you know, the only way they can numb that pain is to eat your brain. So it's kind of giving the um, zombies or the undead, it's giving them some sort of purpose, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Instead of them just being walking around killing people they have actually got a motive haven't they which is very clever um which yeah, is i mean if i were in pain like that i would probably do the same thing you would cave you know yeah and the one of the things that sells that so well is freddie and frank whenever they're starting to cross over from the chemicals particularly uh tom matthews who plays freddie mm. when he's talking about how much pain he's in and when he's screaming in pain especially whenever they're moving frank to and he's screaming hmm. That is so horrifying. Yeah. And it's so realistic for that level of pain. And if they're feeling that and they're just now starting to yeah. to die and they're feeling the rigor mortis, what are the other really rotten corpses feeling? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, this, and I think that's a clever spin. And the, um, it, and the other thing is, like, it's, like we mentioned earlier, you can't kill them with a headshot like you could in uh, Night Living Dead. So they kind of changed the game a bit, haven't they? And, and also... This is a discussion online as well, where people say this is the first time you see zombies that actually run, because a lot of people say, "Well, it only happened in 28 Days Later," which is a great, great movie, but it actually happened in 1985 in this movie. Do you know what I mean? All the, all these are running zombies, and you just can't kill them. You can't headshot them, and even when you burn them, you know the vapor goes up into the sky and then it comes back down. It starts all over again, doesn't it? So you are. You're in a no-win situation now, aren't you, with this movie, really? It's just, there's no way of really stopping it. Which is a perfect snapshot for the 80s. We were all, all terrified about the possibility <laughs> of nuclear war and yeah. that there was no escape and there's nothing you can do and it's just inevitable. And that inevitability being played up in this film is perfect. Yeah. And um, the other thing in the beginning of this film, which is quite good, is the, is the actual intro is when they say, all the events in this film are real. All the characters are real. Do you know what I mean? They just throw that in and it's almost like straight away 
they're saying this is this is like a comedy movie, isn't it? You know, more times I've watched this now. It's, this film isn't taking itself too seriously. And it also takes place over a very important holiday weekend here in the States, mm. uh, July 4th. And it actually starts July 3rd, and then it ends on July 4th with a big bang, which July 4th is famous for fireworks, so there you go. It'd be kind of similar with like uh, maybe uh, 5th of November over there for you guys with the Guy Fox night with burning and fireworks. Yeah, we have that over here. Yeah, firework night, that's it. So yeah, it's 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 just a great film. I'd, like I say, I just never get bored of watching it. Like I say, it's just it, it, it moves at a pace... Just going back to the, is it Ernie character, the guy in the malt tree? I love that scene. Um, I think it's a great comic moment when you get Bert and Freddy, they come in and they've got this body, which he thinks is rabid weasels. But you've got Ernie, <laughs> isn't he? He's like, you know, he's got his headphones on, is not he? You know, he's listening to some Beethoven or something like that. And I think it's it, Wagner because they're hinting oh, that he's a former Nazi. Wagner, that's right, that's it. And it's yeah. just where he's got his pipe, isn't he? He's just, you know, he's in his own little bubble, isn't he? And then the door opens up, and then as soon as Bert taps him on the shoulder, he just pulls this Luger out, doesn't he? And just <laughs> turns around and chucks it in his face, doesn't he? Do you know what I mean? You think, wow, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> that's a great moment. I and love the body, that scene. The, yeah, the body that he's working on, too, because he's a more mortician. Um, they have really great makeup, the way they painted uh, the lividity for all of the blood settling in on his organs, where you see the yellow and the purple. The rest of him is very gray. It's very realistic, the way that they did that body. The the fine incision that's stitched back up or whatever it was that goes down the side of his stomach, like maybe it was a failed surgery or whatever, and they just haphazardly put him back together to ship him out yeah. um, while Ernie's working on him. And he's doing the... He's doing like a little bit of an embalming. So you see the needle going in and out of the person's stomach. Mm. And he's so calmly just smoking on a pipe, listening to Wagner while he's doing it. Like no big deal to him at all. And I think they do the same thing where they always do with morticians where he even grabs a bite of sandwich while he's working or something uh, like that. Because they yeah. always have to do that to show you just how like they don't care that they're right next to a rotten <laughs> body that they'll even eat. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because he's, he's like you say, showing Bert and Freddie how to break out of rig and mortis, isn't he? Well, sipping on a coffee. And then Bert basically goes, that's very, very interesting, Ernie. You know, he says it with some trepidation, doesn't he? But I've got this other problem, mate. Do you know what I mean? I've got this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then Ernie goes, well, what is it, man? You know, what the hell is it? And he, and he goes, now, I've known you for a long time, haven't I? And he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, he's rabid weasels. And he goes, why, why don't you just shoot him? And he's just laughing, isn't he? <laughs> and then this hand yeah, he's comes got, out. I got a gun. We'll take him out back. <laughs> yeah, this is it. <laughs> And then this hand comes out, doesn't he? And you see like Ernie's face going, what the hell? And it's just, again, it's just so many comic elements in this film. It just goes from one after the other. It's just fantastic. So, uh, and you're always constantly getting character development as well, don't you know, with, these, with each character. It's great. Sometimes it's just in little things that they say about themselves. And sometimes it's actually just a little piece of information that is done visually, like the Wagner being played, the leather overcoat that Ernie wears later on, like mm. the fact that he's got this really, really white hair. Yeah. And I believe the guy who plays Ernie in this film was an SCTV alum, was he not? I can't remember the actor's name, but I remember seeing him in SCTV, that Canadian comedy channel uh, or, or TV show that was like sort of a Saturday Night Live answer that was done in canada that's where like john belushi i think and uh yeah um, um he's john named, candy got their start his name is called don calfa ernie yes don it's calfa a, i yeah, couldn't don, think of the name don off the top calfa, of my head it, yeah and uh but it's called clue Klang, Klanger. uh i think clue, don, uh clue gallagher clue yeah he gallagher, was in so. nightmare on Elm street too as well he was oh, uh jesse's oh. dad oh okay and I know James Coran, he's been in some horror movies, is not he? He was in uh, Poltergeist 2, wasn't he? Um, and he was also in... Oh, there was that sci-fi movie, wasn't it? Um, Invaders from Mars. I think it was like the remake that they made in the 80s as well. He plays the colonel in that. Oh, uh, that would make sense, because I think Toby Hooper had a little bit to do with uh, Poltergeist 2 and was involved with that. And so Invasion from Mars, that remake, that or the Invaders from Mars remake, that Toby Hooper did, it would make sense that he'd end up in that too. That's right, yeah. Toby, and um, Toby Hooper was actually supposed to direct this as well. 
Um, but he actually gave the script to Dan and Bannon just to sort of say, look, can you have a look at this? Just flavour it up a bit. And um, Dan O'Bannon ended up taking it on. He, so, you know, and obviously Dan O'Bannon, he's... Didn't he write Alien? Was he the writer of Alien? Yes. He did a screenplay, didn't he? So, Yeah. Um, he wrote Alien based on Planet of the Vampires. Let's just not mince words about that. It's very heavily <laughs> based on Mario Baba's Planet of the Vampires. Uh, John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon worked together for, I think it was the the student film that t- sort of launched Dark Carpenter's Stop. career. Dark Star. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he actually, and I, yeah, he wrote all. He was actually one of the characters and, in that as well. Yeah, and John Carpenter actually said that Dan O'Bannon was the biggest pleasurist he's ever met. So I'm not the first person to imply that about the Alien script. It still became a brilliant film, do not get me wrong. Mm. But it started from heavily inspired by other areas let's put it that way oh my God, same thing yeah. with dark star <laughs> yeah that's kind of been said about a lot of movies isn't it Do you know what i mean it's the same with as we said before as you said with poltergeist wasn't it there's that thing whether is it is it a, a steven spielberg movie or is it toby Ho- hooper movie you know so well that's kind of the the downside and the sad thing and more tragic stuff about toby hooper's career and it is a bit of a bummer, but it also gave us Texas Chainsaw 2, which I'd like to throw my ring in the hat to do if you're ever going to do that on Bite Size, because that's my favorite of all of them, because oh, it is really? so 80s and over the top. Oh, you know what? I'll tell you now, Cole, I've never actually seen number two. I've heard an awful lot about <gasps> it. No, no, I haven't oh. seen number two, no. Oh, dude, yeah, you, yeah, you got to do it for Bite Size, and, uh-huh. and I got to be on it with you, because that's okay. my favorite. I love Chainsaw 2. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll put you down on the list for that then, Cool. I will check out that film. I've heard <laughs> it's supposed to be a hell of a movie, isn't it? I think you... Didn't you... You've covered it, haven't you? Podcast? Um, I don't think... I, I haven't done it on my show on Cinema PsyOps, but I talk about it quite a bit, because I love Chainsaw 2. It's so insane and so over the top. And just so freaking 80s. But I, I absolutely love that movie. And it, it fits in perfectly with Return of the Living Dead. Because it has that same kind of like weird horror comedy mix that just doesn't quite go there. And it's super gory too. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll, I will put you down for that one. And I will promise I'll check that out for the uh, for the show. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's Return of the Living Dead. Cool. Um, is there any more that you want to talk about this film? Because... Uh, there's an actress named Jules Shepard who plays one of the punk rockers. She's the one with the hair that's sort of like painted up and spiked up into a sort of mohawk look. And she's also the one whenever uh, Linnea Quigley's character Trash is stripping, they cut to her and she goes, are you high on anything? <laughs> whenever oh, oh, yeah, they're that's doing right. that. Yeah, that's it. She's, um, oh, I should have her character name written down. Uh, she's with the, oh, oh hang on, there's one character we haven't mentioned here, have we? trying to think of his name now but yeah i know the one you're talking about actually i think she was the actual stripper wasn't she casey is it casey her name yeah jewel shepherd casey yeah, is it. her name yeah, yeah. That's it. um jewel shipper jewel shepherd i think she ended up in playboy and i know that she did a movie for the playboy channel that we covered on my show called christina mm. um but she actually was a a, a strip performer uh, in LA and that's how she kind of got her- hired which is really odd that she didn't end up doing the dance I don't know why it ended up being Linnea Quigley or if they just shifted some stuff around uh, honestly I think they both should have been doing it they should have been competing on the tombstone for attention yeah you know yeah, that would have been yeah, that would have been absolutely incredible they could have done um, a combo actually talking about trash there's a thing there isn't it with her sh- when she stripped naked wasn't there where they had to make a was it like a sort of latex vagina or something like that didn't they because like, they couldn't have her obviously it, it, exposed it was a skin flap thing that they sort of secured over her that they had to put over the nail quickly they would glue down and it basically made her look like a barbie doll where it was like completely smooth and it covered her whole naughty bits underneath and i guess it wrapped around to the buttocks side because there's a sequence when she's dancing where the camera's right up there yeah. and it, you know in order for them to get an r rating they couldn't do full frontal nudity and that's why they did that and then there's a sequence where they shoot her from behind and she's shaking her butt and you can kind of see the appliance a little bit more. And that had to be super uncomfortable because it's glued over the areas that you would use to relieve yourself. So she probably couldn't eat or drink anything mm. for these sequences. Oh and that carried God. on to whenever she gets zombified, which, by the way, she is the sexiest zombie that has ever existed. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because <laughs> her, her fantasy gets um, produced, doesn't it? Because she's, she says to Spider, she? she says, yeah, before about dying. 
And then she's got this fantasy about being eaten by lots of old men or something. Isn't it? <laughs> That's and what then, makes her start uh, stripping. And apparently it's something yeah. she does all the time because one of the guys, the, the sleazeball, like sort of new wave looking guy with the boom box says, uh oh, trash is taking her clothes off again. Yeah, and she's like it. all excited about it. Oh yeah, that's right. He's yeah, he's he's uh I've, I've, again another character. I should know his name. He's the one who wears the suit, isn't he? He's very sort of new uh, wave, very new wave. Yeah, new wave. Um, yeah, that's it. That's the word. That's the word I was looking for. Well, all the other characters are so over the top. So Jules Shepard's Casey, and then that particular character that's all all new wave. I mean. They have a really beautiful moment, and that's why I wanted to kind of bring them up, where they're in the you need a medical supply, and they've locked themselves like into a room, and they're just kind of like hiding out in there, and they're waiting to know what's going to happen or to be rescued. And she actually says to him, like, I never liked you, but oh God, please hold me, because she was so scared. Mm. And that was a really sweet and tender moment, and I think Jules Shepard played that really real and, and beautifully. So I wanted to mention that moment. I, I That's one of the moments that really just pulls at my heartstrings before we get to that ultimate finale uh and we mentioned suicide we and yeah, i, I, I kind of wanted to talk about him a little bit more too um, mm. i mentioned it on my show when we covered this <laughs> that was me in my my youth like in my teens oh, and my oh, 20s okay. i was like i was that angry guy now i didn't have an x shaped into my head or anything but mm. like you know, when I would just start ranting and raving about like, no one understands me, man. You think this is a fucking costume? <laughs> this is my life. Like, yeah. I was like that intense all the fucking mm. time. Like, even when I first met Matt, I was still kind of that intense. I've mellowed out since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember you guys talked about this on your show, funny enough. And he's almost like, I won the fucking lottery, man. I'm, I'm so pissed off about it. Do you know what I mean? He's just like, you know, he's just angry about everything, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? And, he's, and I love that bit when he's driving... It's his first scene when he's in the car and he's just angry, isn't he? And then I think Scuzz says something, doesn't he? And he just cut, he takes he his says hands. You're spooky. Yeah, he takes his hands yeah. off the wheel and he just grabs Scuzz, did not he? And he just like he's not concentrating on his driving, is he? Do you know what I mean? It's just great. And what's what what's funny about that is he's using the floorboard of the car to launch himself at Scuzz. Yeah. And instead of like hitting the brakes to do it, he slams on the gas with one foot. So the car <laughs> speeds up and he's launching himself at the back yeah. at Scuzz. He's like Oh, I'm spooky. Well, fuck you. And he just goes after him and he just like starts like choking at Scuzz and everything. Or no, Spider. He goes after Spider and says that. And then Scuzz has to grab the wheel, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and he's super pissed off. He's like, you guys never call me unless you need a ride. Why do you always call me if you need a ride? You know, <laughs> he's like, I don't have gas. You want to buy gas? He's just like pissed about everything. Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Even when he goes into the cemetery, he goes, oh, there's rubbish everywhere. This place is so damn unclean, isn't it? Like that. He's gone. <laughs> And, and then another- he's pissed off because uh, Linnea Quigley's character Trash wants to sleep with him, yeah. and she's like coming on to him, and he's like, "Have some respect for the dead." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> he's like angry, and it's like yeah. you're you're in there trashing the cemetery even worse than what you were, kicking stuff around and oh, breaking your way man. into the thing with torches and flares. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another thing just before this scene. I think it's the first scene where you see him, and they're walking down the high, walking down the street, aren't they? And uh, I think it might have been Scars or something like that. He says to Tina, and he goes, oh, where's Freddy tonight? And she goes, oh, well, he got himself a job. And he goes, got himself a job? What a dick. You know what I mean? What's he got himself a job, man? You know? <laughs> Which is a very punk rock thing to do. You know, how are we going to hang out with you and party all the time? Because yeah. you know where all the wonderful places are to party. Yeah, yeah You're working. What a jerk. You're interfering with my party. Yeah, and like I say, and the other thing I was going to say is that um, all these actors, they've, they've all, they've all um, if you look on social media, um, there's this family of these guys that have reunited. They've done reunions and stuff like that. I think Beverly Randolph and Tom Matthews are very active on the Facebook page. Uh, they post loads of stuff on there. So, um, But they're always saying they're having reunions and stuff like that, So, which is pretty cool. So... Um, it's a testament to how well they actually got on set with this movie. Do you know what I mean, they were having a lot of fun, which you know you can see in this film. You know, so I imagine a lot of stuff was probably ad libbed as well between the characters as well with the lines and stuff like that. I would hope so because a lot of that dialogue does flow relatively naturally. I mean, the, especially the scene that you brought up when they're listening to it's TSOL's uh, "Got Nothing for You" when they're just kind of walking down the street and it's. It's showing this sort of like nihilistic, there's no point in life thing Mm. that these kids all have. And that dialogue that they're delivering back and forth with each other and they're just giving each other shit, it just felt 
really natural. So if that was actually on the page exactly as it is, then those actors had to really rehearse it to make it feel like people who are actually just giving shit to each other and interacting with each other because that's what it feels like oh, yeah, whenever absolutely. their characters are yeah. all talking. Yeah, that- Especially when they're reacting to like all the crazy stuff that starts happening where the dead come back to life. Where they're literally like, you know, what's in that rain? Why is it burning? Uh, give me your clothes. You know, like all of that kind of stuff feels like things that people would actually say in such a ridiculous situation. Like, how are you supposed to react to this acid rain that's burning your skin and smells awful? And then all of a sudden the dead start coming out of a cemetery. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And uh, the other thing to mention as well is that the zombies in this or the undead or however you want to call them, they they actually talk as well, didn't they? Because then you've got the, was it the paramedics or the police officer? He goes, send more, send more paramedics. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And it's like, send it's, more cops. <laughs> and it's it's kind of haunting in a way as well, isn't it? Because you know they're going to react to that, aren't they? The cops or the paramedics and they turn up and then they get bombarded. So um, It's actually pretty it's, genius because the dead are really smart in the way that they plot they go off and they hide Mm. then they have one person calling for backup or for help then whenever those two come in then the dead swarm in and they eat the brains then they drag the bodies off because the bodies aren't really left in a lot of places as well so they're hiding the bodies it's this really tactical like swarm attack that they're they're doing and that's what makes them super horrifying is they'll wait they'll be patient enough and they'll just wait but as soon as people are there they swarm them and they can't control themselves like almost like junkies jumping for their their heroin or, or their meth or something you know yeah, exactly, and yeah. th- they're really good at that that's that's what's so terrifying is they're just waiting and they'll figure it out and they have like this weird tactical thing that they'll do or they'll use the fact that they're screaming in pain to draw in even more paramedics or something like that <laughs> and then as you mentioned you got trash turned into a zombie isn't she? and then she leads like the attack didn't she with the police officers they put in like a cordon with the guns there's a really good scene where she um, comes out from the sort of smoke isn't it or the fog and she comes running out and her hair is all red isn't it she's she's gone like a sort of pasty sort of white colour as well isn't she and like I say she oh, takes yeah. out all these police officers that, that particular scene was very influential on a very young court psyops and what he found attractive <laughs> and hot <laughs> um that may have been what that may have been what did the damage that got me into the weird stuff i'm into man oh, okay. <laughs> um so yeah so you get that almost like coming up to the finale now haven't you with um everybody's kind of been split up i mean you're like uh, freddy's turning into a zombie um you've got bert with spider and the rest of the gang in the warehouse and then bert's come up to uh one of those canisters and he's thought let's give this number a call isn't it you know what else are we going to do you know if that, that number must be on there for a reason he gives it a call doesn't he and then it goes into the army and you get that dude in the well he's got the missile isn't he on that carrier yep that's all does it go in no it goes to cur- the colonel doesn't it I mean um, yeah the, the call colonel. goes to someone that then gets rerouted to the colonel and you actually see the waiting back and forth they had to get Tarman out of the basement then they smack the head off of the top of Tar Man with the baseball bat. So now his head is one area and his body's in the other. So he's just running around the Unita Supply, smearing that weird gunky stuff that's left of him yeah. everywhere. Um, suicide, for whatever reason, his body stays on the ground. He never resurrects. I was waiting for that jump scare of suicide popping up, screaming brains, but that never happened. Oh, you know what? All the times I've actually watched this, I never actually thought of that. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, it doesn't, does he? He's laying there dead and he never... like. If Trash comes back from the dead after she gets eaten by all those old men, hmm. why didn't Suicide pop back up and scream brains at them? That's a good point. You know what? All the times I've watched this film, I've never thought about that. Um, yeah, that would have been, that would have been quite good, actually, to see Suicide as a zombie, see how he would have been. Would he, be, would he, been, would he still would have been angry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Angry yeah, zombie. He would have been like... He, he would have been, like, yelling at them, like, you fucking bastard, you left me in this basement, blah, 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 blah. You know, just, like, just like screaming at him. He's like, and now I'm going to eat your brains, every single one of them. You know, like, yeah, he just it. hulk out at him or something. Oh, man, my jaw's rotting. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, that. Um, so, yeah, so you get this nuke, don't you? And that's pretty much how this film comes to an end, isn't it? It just gets blown up and then... You get the colonel come out and say, well, 
He's put this down to a success, hasn't he? You know, the arsehole that he is. He's basically said, oh, it's okay, we've only lost, what, 4,000 people? Yeah, they blow <laughs> up an entire city yeah. to try and contain it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's you know, they, they, have, they come up with a cover story as to why the nuclear blast happened. They think it's going to be minimal radiation because they use something besides an atom bomb. I think it's like a neutron bomb or something mm. like that to where... They think it's going to be okay, and then all of a sudden the rain's going to happen, and they think all the radiation is going to get washed away by the rain, so everything's going to be covered up and be fine, but they're reusing the rainstorm for the resurrection at the beginning again, and that's when people sh sort of really need to realize that this is just going to get that much worse, that the nuclear explosion for all the dead just released even more of the chemical into the air, and that's what makes it such a grim and down ending. So you were having this fun ride that's absolutely horrifying. Yeah. And then the movie gives you this one-two gut punch of nuclear weapons being used in an American city just to solve a problem that they can't solve otherwise. And then it just makes it even worse. And this is going to be the end of the world because no matter what you do, you can't stop or contain these things. No, that's it. It's just going to be a knock-on effect, isn't it? Whatever you do. And um, like I say, you get the rain come down and it kind of opens up for a sequel. Uh, which we got and you've also got the bit that happens at the at the beginning isn't it where you've got the skeleton that comes out doesn't it and you've got the do you want a party then yeah that song that 45 grave 45 yeah. grave um which is obviously Man, diana you know, cancer has a whale doesn't she that that screamy singing that she does just really just cuts right into your guts where you're yeah. like yes i will party because you're scared of her otherwise yeah which was the toned down version for the movie, wasn't it? Uh, they did the zombie version, didn't they? That song. Um, but yeah, yeah um, the actual song "Do You Want a Party" is a different tone and sound altogether. Um, party time. They, they. It's actually kind of a sort of a protest song. I can't remember exactly what the original subject was, but it was a very dark thing that they ended up sort of toning down and making it not necessarily more fun, but just more intense. Where it's still scary, but. They just focus the lyrics on do you want to party it's party time yeah, yeah the actual lyrics for those original song are very dark very 45 dark. grave is mm. one of the darkest punk bands yeah it's um yeah they very cleverly what they do with the 80s isn't it this end song or the song which they play during the movie quite a lot um is actually telling you a story of what's happening isn't it you know very young you know talking about the punks and generally what it's like to be a punk and all that isn't it really with 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 this movie so um so yeah so you get that and then obviously i'll say this it spawned a sequel didn't it you got return of the living dead number part two initially i didn't like it as much because it goes a lot more silly and a lot more over the top i mean they even do a thriller reference where there's a zombie that looks like michael jackson at one point and they're all moving with him and shaking just like him mm. as they walk around um, there's a scene where they, they try to mimic the zombie that was in the morgue that ends up killing Scuzz and then they sort of interrogate strapped to the morgue table with uh, just like a severed head one where she's like, get that screwdriver out of my head. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a little sillier. It's a little more fun. Um, and it kind of misses the mark a lot more with a lot of those kind of jokes. It doesn't quite work, but the parts that do work for me are still very scary and I think the older I got and the less um, like suicide I actually was, the more I learned to enjoy the film for what it was. Yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> I think it helped. It helped. I watched it one night on Joe Bob's Monster Vision as a kid, and I ended up enjoying it a lot more knowing the behind the scenes and just kind of like watching the film for what it was instead of what I wanted it to be, which was just an, another rehash of Return of the Living Dead. Um, I'm a huge fan, actually, of Return of the Living Dead 3. Because that mixes in sort of like a sex and death sort of thing that uh, Brian Yunsna did. And Return of the Living Dead 3 gets really dark and really weird, but it's also very sexual. Mm. And she she mixes pain. Like, she uses pain to, to, like, squench her hunger for brains and things like that. And she's also, like, this sort of like all somewhat sadomasochistic character. And then all the piercings and weird mutilations she does to her body are very sensual and very disturbing all at once. Very reanimator, very Brian Yunzna kind of stuff. So that one's excellent. I really like that one. It also has Sarah Douglas in it, so that's kind of a nice thing. Yeah, didn't that one come out in the 90s? Uh, Return of the yeah. Free was a 90s um, movie. There's another film. Uh, I mentioned this one the other day with uh, Dan Bone. was... Um, 
Bud the Chud 2. Chud 2, funny enough. I mean, it's got nothing to do with the original Chud movie, but... No, no, not at all, because they're actually reanimated corpses in Chud yeah. 2, mm. and Chud, they're like these weird mutated people that live in the sewers, but yeah. I actually... I, I actually, and I'm, I'm just going to say it, I like Bud the Chud more than, than Chud. Oh, I really? find it more entertaining. Oh, okay. It's way yeah. more fun for me to watch. Mm. It's not a good movie, but it's hilarious <laughs> and I love it. Yeah, well, I'm all, I'm guilty of that. Just cool. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, just looking at uh, Bud the Chud, I just saw the similarities with this. Do you know what I mean? Like a resurrection and all that and... You know, oh yeah, you could you could watch so. them back to back. Yeah, um, this was it. But, but the Chud was a USA Up All Night movie all the time, and I think Return of the Living Dead ended up on USA Up All Night a couple times too. Mm. And I wouldn't be surprised if they did play them back to back as like a theme night. Yeah. Um, so there you go. You could almost say as well, just on a slight tangent here, where you've got Tom Matthews, quite a big fan of him as an actor. Actually, I liked him um, in this, and he also did uh, Jason Lives. Um, which is one of my favourite Jason movies. I just, I, again, I, I think that kind of it's something about the mid '80s where they kind of you you had a song, then you had Alice Cooper doing the soundtrack, and you also had Jason come back as a zombie in that one. Do you know what I mean? And again, he's a guy that you just can't seem to kill. So, well, it's, what's great about Jason Lives too is it's very gothic and it feels very much like a Hammer film at the start, and then mm. it sort of morphs into the slasher aspects. Yeah. And there's a there's a guy named Court in that movie, so I, I really enjoy that one too. <laughs> yes, there is. Yeah, <laughs> that one's that one's the one I enjoy watching the absolute most. Mm. Um, my favorite's probably Part Four. I really really love Part Four, but like Six was my favorite for the longest time, and I always have the most fun watching Jason Lives mm. because it, it's, it's another perfect snapshot of the '80s. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. I think was it come out in 1986? I think, but like I say, it's got that. Alice Cooper's soundtrack. So it's, I find, I've said, I say this on all my shows, as you know, it's always, you know, if a film's got a really good soundtrack, you can really compliment that movie. Do you know what I mean? Just move it along. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, there, yeah, there are other movies which I can associate with this film. But yeah, on the whole, man, it's just, I, I, I can just keep on watching this movie. Do you know what I mean? I never get fed up with it. And the other thing I was going to say is that I've introduced this to my. Um, 15 year old daughter and she's seen Return of the Living Dead absolutely loved it absolutely loved it I mean me and her when awesome. I speak to her um, we we very f- more more often than not recite this movie or most of the films that she watches with me do you know what I mean which I introduce her to you know she's um, she's you know Return of the Living Dead she's also a big fan of the Burbs as well so <laughs> nice that's my wife's like all time favourite movie we watch that several times a year yeah <laughs> so uh, like I say cool, as and, you know there's just I know you're a fan of it's just some films you just can't get away from isn't it do you know what I mean I just I keep putting I always watch this insane. once a year mm. around this time of year because it's it takes place over 4th of July yeah. within 4th of July weekend so it starts at July 3rd I try to watch it every year on July 3rd. Now, obviously, I hit it early to be able to, to do your show, but yeah. it seems like this time of year, right around July 3rd or July 4th, I watch this movie at least once a year. In and fact, yeah. I, it never fails. Like, I didn't even intend to do it this year, and I ended up doing it. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, like you say, we are not far away from that date at all now, are we? We've uh, a few days away from that. So, um, yeah, so cool. I, it's great having you on the show. It's really good to talk to you. Um, the moment's finally come. We're talking about a movie together. Do you know what I mean? I've been listening to your show for such a long time now. And um, I've had a whole ton of fun, man. It's just been great. Oh, yeah. This was a total blast. And when we first started talking about, you know, like movies to cover on your show on Bite Size and stuff, I kept throwing my hat in the ring for like all this stuff where I'm like, oh, we can do this and we can do this. Mm. And I'm like, why don't we record all of this stuff all at once? And you're like, settle down. It's okay. <laughs> We'll do another show later. And I'm like, no, no, we got to do this now. I got so excited. And <laughs> no, well, well, That's really who I am. I'm that cartoon character that's following around that bulldog named Spike, the little the little yappy dog. It's like, hey, Spike, let's do this. Let's do this. Because I get that <laughs> excitable. Well, no, I'm glad that you are. I'll tell you someone else is guilty of that. And he's probably listened to this now. Dan Bone. He's come on to the show. <laughs> we're, we're, we're already on episode number four together. We was only supposed to do Masters of the Universe. And we got to the end of that show. We had a great time. I knew it was always going to be a good time talking to Dan. And uh, I said, uh, 
So next episode we're going to do is Enter the Dragon and Dan's gone, ooh. <laughs> so then we did Enter the Dragon and I said, next episode I'm doing is Police Story. He's gone, I like that one too. And we just continued now, do you know what I mean? And we've got a whole list to do, which is great. So well, that's, uh, that's yeah. why I'm naming off all the stuff that I want to do because I don't want, I want to get to it before Dan Bone does. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, stay away. <laughs> it's not fair. Dan's covered all the fun stuff. I've uh, created a Legion podcast battle. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to compete with him. He's going to be a better guest than me. He's no, much no, more no, charismatic. No, 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 no. It's, it, it's, it's, it's great having you guys on the show. I'm really having a blast. And, you know, it's long may it continue, man. Like I say, if there's anything you want, wanna, in fact, there is one, isn't there? You said about... Jim Carter, wasn't it? The sort of uh, yeah, uh, action movie, isn't it? I would love to do Jim Carter. Um, I'm throwing my hat in the ring, definitely for Texas Chainsaw 2. I want that one more than anybody else because I don't, no one loves that film as much as me. I swear, Texas Chainsaw 2. Uh, the China O'Brien movies, because you guys mentioned that whenever you were doing Enter the Dragon, because that same director did Jim Carter and both China O'Brien 1 and 2. Yes, he and did. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm a fan of those three films, and I like to advocate for them because I don't think they get the love that they deserve. Yeah. And I think this format for Bite Size is perfect for that kind of thing, mm. to show love for, for a movie that other people kind of cast aside. And I think Cynthia Rothrock sadly came along, along at the wrong time because she would have been an amazing action star had she been given the budget and the time that Golden Harvest would have had the money because they were starting to sort of dwindle or, or their their waning period was happening right as she came along with China O'Brien and a lot of those films. So, I mean, I would love to champion Cynthia Rothrock's movies, particularly China O'Brien 1 and 2 and Jim Cotta and, and Texas Chainsaw 2. I, I definitely got to do because I absolutely love that movie as well. Well, I'll put you down on there for that. I mean, if you want, we can do uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 because out, out of those movies, that sounds like the one you really want to... Sort of get on board yeah. and champion some more for that. So I will read that <laughs> yeah. out. That's fine. Because we're talking soundtracks and, and snapshots of the 80s, and it's it's a perfect segue to start <laughs> off of from this film. Yeah, no, like I say, um, that, that going on what you just said there, though, there is these films which, you know, I've watched. One of those films for me is uh, Streets of Fire. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I just, I just can't. See, I only, I only discovered that film, I don't know, about seven years ago. Um, and I just, well, after I watched it, I thought, how have I never seen this film, and why is this film not more talked about? Do you know what I mean? It's got action, uh, it's got great, great soundtrack, characters, comedy. Um, William Defoe plays it like the Joker, and you've got Cody. Oh, in yeah, it. Um, he's so crazy and grimy in that. It's a mm, Walter Hill film, yeah, and um, it's basically a Walter Hill musical. Yeah. Uh, I forget the guy's name who did the music, but he's basically the guy who made Meatloaf who he is. Because he did a lot of the the musical writing, yes, yes. and it has, has that very epic feel to it. And the band that uh, is it, Diane Lane is the main character. Yeah, the or Blasters. The, 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 yeah, the Blasters. Yeah, yeah. So, so the guy that you're talking about is Jim Steinman. Um, he did Jim the Steinman. Mm. That's the name. Why couldn't yeah. I think of that? Oh, that movie's so good. I love that film. Mm. So he did all the music for. Um, uh, there's it the band Hot from the eighties. Um, also. Bonnie Tyler he did the music yeah Bonnie anything Tyler's any of that like really epic very operatic 80s stuff with it's like really heavily produced like just a tour de force music that just really hits you right in the heart mm. and just like grabs a hold of it and makes it start beating like Steinman wrote some of the most epic 80s songs of all time yeah and he is just let loose all over that soundtrack for Streets of Fire and then they have of Rye Coder doing all the bluesy like slide guitar stuff that yeah. basically is like Cody's theme song. Yeah, the Streets yeah. of Fire is amazing. Yeah, that's it. When he turns up on the train, you know, and his sister says, you know, Cody, come home, I need your help. And um, the other thing to say with that movie, having a massive Streets of Fire tangent here, is is that Streets of Fire is responsible for the 8-bit video game, uh, Final Fight, Double Dragon. So it's got a legacy. And I just think this film deserves more credit than it gets, really. I just can't understand how it just didn't do well. Do you know what I mean? It's just... Well, if you want to do that one with me, I'll, I'll definitely give that one some love oh. if nobody else is ready to step up. But yeah. I know that uh, Gary Hill loves Streets of Fire just as much as I do, too. So there you go. Oh, yeah. Gary's great. I, I, as you know, I've had him on the show. 
Gary Hill was just the dry sense of humor, man. He just has me in hysterics, man. <laughs> yeah, Gary's great. I love that guy. He will just come out and surprise you. You can be in a conversation like we are now and he'll just throw something in. Do you know what I mean? We were talking about the uh, the gate the other day and we were talking about the um, the rock band in that. The Kid of the Wolves. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Gary just comes out and goes, Canadian metal. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> you know, just that's a Gary, that's a Gary Hill moment right there. <laughs> yeah, it's great. That's man. another movie that fits in perfect with Return of the Return of the Living Dead. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just we we just had a lot of fun in the mid eighties, didn't we, with these films? You know, just so many films that came out, unbelievable. So, yeah, good stuff, man. All right, and cool. Well, listen, um, I will get on board for these films. I've got a list here. And like I say, man, it's just <laughs> been a blast. It's just been great to have you on the show. Um, I look forward to speaking to you again. And just before we, before we close the show, do you want to tell us what you're doing next for your podcast? What's your next show? Uh, we are still deep in the Andy Sedaris Full Franchise Fest for the Lethal Ladies series. Um, as of this recording, it is Guns, which is an Eric Estrada starring in his first and probably only villain role. That's going to actually be out um, the Monday after we're done recording this. So the week right before 4th of July over here, because um, 4th of July ends up being on a weekend this year, is when that's going to get released. And then after that, I believe it's Do or Die, which also stars Pat Morita. And uh, we're just going to go from there in order of a release of all of the Andy Sedaris films until we wrap up year six or year five and move into year six. And uh, year six, I'm not going to reveal what's going to get started there because I usually get a theme going. This year is like more sexploitation and just, uh, you know, boobs, guns and all that kind of exploitative film. And uh, I don't know what my theme is going to be next year for year six yet. So I can't really reveal it just yet. Okay, man. Well, thanks, Colt. Uh, if you listen to the show, guys, go and check out uh, Cinema Sarps. It's a great show. Like I say, you've got 250 odd episodes to catch up on. And, um, <laughs> and they're all there, available at legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. <laughs> and uh, talking about Legion, I'm a proud member of Legion Podcast, so please go and check out all the other shows. I will play a promo at the end of this. And if you want to listen to Bite Size Cinema, you can find me on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and several other players on the internet if you put in Bite Size Cinema Legion. And I've also got a Facebook page, so if there's anything you want to post on there, as you can hear, I'm quite busy at the moment, but if you put some stuff on there, you want me to cover a movie, go ahead, man. I'm all for it. Or to shout out The Underdog or something that's famous. And to tell you about what's coming up soon, I've got um, Dan Bone from Haunted Hill is coming back again for the lost boys from 1987 so that will be dropping someone soon in the future and i've also got a listener request which i got today actually from one of my listeners kate pollock little shout out there to you kate uh she's asked if i could do the black cauldron which is a disney movie actually an underrated disney movie so i look forward to doing that and uh, oh, it's one of the darkest Disney movies, like that and the Black Hole, man. And they had a real dark period of films. <laughs> you know what, cool. Yeah. Do you know, when Kate brought that up today, uh, it's funny you say that. I, I, when I was growing up, I, I saw the Black Cauldron advertised, but nobody seemed to be talking about it. And being a horror nerd as a sort of 10-year-old or whatever, I said, I want to see that film. Everybody seemed to be talking about Peter Pan and everything like that. I was like, no, I want to go and see the Black Cauldron. That looks badass. And it is, isn't it? I'm, it's. Uh, I'm going to look forward to talking about It's like about Disney that, taking a crack at heavy metal almost. Mm. It's so dark. Well, apparently um, uh, Ralph Baschke was going to take it on, um, who did the Lord of the Rings from 1978 and Fire and Ice, which I recently discovered. And he did that rotoscope thing, isn't it, where you have live action with animation. And yep. I think you probably would have had an even darker movie with that. But um, yeah, with the Black Yeah, Hulk- Bakshi's uh, had a very dark turn to him, mm. especially like his stuff. I think he did Wizards yes. as well, which gets really, really dark. Yeah, he did. He um, he did Wizards. So I, I, I do like his style of animation. Um, so yeah, I'll be checking out. And also, cool, as you mentioned, the Black Hole Man. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, that movie is... 
Yeah, it's it's basically a horror movie, isn't it? Really. Um, oh yeah, totally. It's because um, there's an unofficial remake that came out called the Black uh, oh, Event Horizon. When I saw that in the nineties, <laughs> I thought that is a remake of the Black Hole, which is unofficial. I'm damn sure it is. You know, ship going into space, finding another ship. You know, all hell breaks loose, pretty much. Yeah. Black holes right there. Wow, I never <laughs> thought of it like that, but uh, yeah, I love even I love Event Horizon even more now because yeah, yeah, it totally is a remake. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll leave that for all you cool. So anyway, guys, listen. Um, hope you enjoyed the show, and as always, keep it bite size. Keep- if you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema Psyops, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts. Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.